How you doing, man? Bless, King. How are you? Man, I can't complain, man. Good to see you, brother. Yeah, man. Good to see you as well, man. It's, it's some crazy times we living in, but doing what we maintain. You know what I mean? I just want to say before we even get started, man, like, this is a BS music industry, but it, it's good to find people that's good people in the music industry. And Torre, you you're one of my favorite people in this game, dog. Word up, word up. As we started the convo, man, you know, just wanted to sing your praises as somebody who has always stood tall and true in this business. And we know how um, this industry is a crazy industry. You know, it's a definitely a what can you do for me? Who you affiliated with? Yeah. Uh, what's your latest hit? You know, which is, you know, it's just all of the convoluted nonsense. And when you find genuine people in the business, um, it's always good to connect with them, man, like minds and kindred spirits. So, Knife, what have you been doing during this quarantine? Uh, we see the Fast Auntie Lounge. I want you to break that down. <laughs> <What are> you <laughs> doing? <laughs> I, want you, I want you to break down the meaning and the terminology behind that wording. And, uh, you know, just outside of that, what else you got going? You know, um, <clears throat> Fast... Fast is is country for fast, right. um, and fast. I don't know how, how how different it is across the country. Whether it be you know whatever, fast is the term for you know a woman that's you know out getting hers or whatever. Well, younger you know older people used to say you out here being fast. You know what right. I mean? Right, exactly. But as you got older. The fast auntie, well, fast women is, is like very career driven, very go getter, very intelligent, very you know, I'm about to get mine type thing, and and taking control of their life. And so, a lot of these women, man, are aunties. Word up. <laughs> it's like Word you know up. what I mean. It's like you know they, they. And so I put the two together, and fast aunties. This is pretty much it, because you know for me. Um, you know, and you know this to be true. A lot of women that used to listen to hip hop with us when we grew up, mm -hmm. they kind of fell out of love with it. You know, right. for for obvious reasons, for several reasons, because it doesn't speak to them anymore. But I'm not, but I remember a time when it did, and so I missed that. You know what I mean? I, I really missed that that type of energy that you know I had when I was in high school or in college. The people that was around me listened to hip hop as much as I did, and so it's kind of like of an extension of ninety five live, which I already do. Right. And is it somewhere, man? Is especially what's going on between online between men and women right now with Fast Auntie Lounge, man? For for me, I just want to play good music and people come enjoy it and reminisce and be nostalgic, and I don't have to play all the new stuff and I don't got to do that like. If it's new and I like it, I play it. But other than that, man, most of my fans Sundays they say we just play nineties all night. I really don't care about nothing. Else. <laughs> and that's what you know what I mean, and that's what I I dig. But I, you know, I play seventies, I play eighties, I play nineties, I play stuff in the two thousands. I don't play a lot of new new stuff unless I did it or if something comes from Jamla or somebody stuff that I really like. I played the um, I played the uh, that amazing song with Tiana Taylor and Rick Ross the other night. That's fire. Um, yeah, because it's, it, it's just soulful. It's got their energy, in, and mm -hmm. I play that. And You know, we used to have a good time, man. We used to have a good time, and it just ain't going to be none of that rah-rah in, in, in Fast Auntie <laughs> Lounge. And the Fast Aunties will kick you out, man. They ain't got time for it. <laughs> Shout out to all the Fast Aunties out there. My, my, my auntie just tell me, Stay out, you outside with them fast-ass girls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Knife, it's amazing how music brings people together. You know, from all walks of life, um, young to old, you know, different countries, different cultures, as somebody who's traveled the world um, extensively and your music has been out there, man. Um, can you just speak to the power of music and how it does so much for so many people? Wow. Um, you know, music is just as universal as math to me. I always say it all the time. It's the great equalizer. Hip hop music is truly the great equalizer um, across the globe. I think hip hop has passed so many borders, so many genre, uh, genders, so many nationalities, so many language barriers that a lot of other music have not, you know what I mean? You might have a a group or a person from a certain genre of music that is passed, like Bob Marley, 
the right. Beatles, the Stones, you know what I mean, James Brown, mm -hmm. these different people that have in these different genres that have passed and crossed, you know, borders and, and, and nationalities and language barriers, but not like hip hop. Oh, hip hop has been the great equalizer when it comes to speaking to other people. You you've toured, you've been in other countries, and they might not they might not be able to speak the language. Right. When you're on stage, they can rap every song. Verbatim. Verbatim. And when when you come off to ask you for an autograph, there may be a language barrier there. That's the amazing part. They don't know the words to ask you for an autograph, but do they know the words of Wu-Tang Cream? Yes, they do. And so that's, you know, music has always been that great equalizer for me, and especially hip-hop. And I'm glad that hip-hop always finds a way to overcome things like whether it be a pandemic or whether it be Trump or whether it be whatever it is, we always find a way to like beat our oppressor every time. For sure. For so, sure. Yeah. It's, it's music has always been that, you know, from the beginning of the time, especially for our people. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we communicated through music. Music got us through the bad times. You just got through the good times. Music got us through slavery, through hanging, through just all of it. Your, your extensive knowledge of music comes from where? Because like you said, even in Fast Aunties, you play 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. We know you as a hip hop and R&B producer, but as a DJ, you know, you're able to cross through so many genres of music. Where did your love for the music come from and how do you have such a, just a diversity in it? My mom and dad, you know, I think that's where it starts, but it also, you know, if you're 40 years old plus, you have a, your lens of how you received it was kind of different from everybody else's because we had MTV and we were, for lack of a better term, forced to learn about Duran Duran and the police and all of these people. Right. Because we were waiting for the one long black video to come on. But we ended up falling in love with all this other stuff. But past even that, man, you know, for me, I was lucky enough to receive a ton of education about the diaspora when I was 14. 13 you know like the juneteenth thing a lot of a lot of people juneteenth is a new idea like they don't right. people are age people right. are covered it's like man i never heard of juneteenth and i can't i can't blame that person for not knowing because the american educational system hadn't done a good job of letting us know what that was terrible job. Um, some people just found out this past week some people found out 10 years ago i was lucky enough to find out when i was 14 and that was at the same time with, I found out when Juneteenth was, and I was listening to Fear Black Planet at the same time. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's crazy. So just me having a love for history like that, and I believe every part of history, especially in the last 50, 60 years, I've had a musical movement to it. Right. So I attach music to history that way. A lot of people, young guru always gets on me. He's like, man, if, if don't nobody know a date, it was some something came out ninth note like he can spit them out because I've always attached music to moments in my life and moments in history. So every time to the listener, every time I'm playing music, they may listen to it. Or, oh, that made me feel good. I remember that back in the day. I'm actually playing a history lesson. Word. Like it's intentional what I play. It's very intentional. If I'm if I'm in the late seventies, I want to stay there. If I'm in the eighties, I want to stay there. I, I hardly don't jump from seventy six to ninety eight. Like I, I don't do that much. I, I like to stay because I'm actually doing a history lesson as I'm playing music, and it's yeah. it's intentional. But I, I can't help it. I just right. can't. So your yeah. your connection between music and education um, is something that we've seen throughout the years. I had the pleasure of sitting in at um, was it at NCC when I sat in with you and play. North Carolina Central University. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, shout out to that whole North Chat. Um, and it was just amazing to see, first and foremost, the interest, you know, from the students, from the class. It was nothing like I had ever experienced before because they were so genuinely engulfed in it all and, and very much, um, very much just learning, but also just very, very, 
I haven't seen people that excited to learn in that way in a very, very long time. Um, and you actually one of the first people, it was you and Clark Kent, two of my big bros. You both called me when the news came out about the class that I was teaching uh, at Mega Evans. Talk to me about just the, um, the, the way that you've been able to merge the worlds of hip hop, music, production, and academia. It is important for me that we, and you know, you and I talked about this. It is important for me for us to tell the, for us, to tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, people of the diaspora, whether be man or woman, doesn't matter. It's up to us to tell the story. I see we, you know, a lot of times we look around and some African American history courses are talking about white people. Right. And some people might be like, "Is like what's that?" You know what I mean? And that's not the knock to say that person haven't done their reading or whatever they had needed to do to be able to talk about this subject. You know, but still, when it comes to hip hop, is one of those things that we don't have a PhD. Hopefully, one day we will. But we know what it means to be a PhD in this subject. You know, to speak, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you standing in a room and you say you never heard Illmatic, well, you, well, okay. You got, you, you got, you got, got some more reading to do. Right. You, you have, you know, so to speak, or some more listening to do. Um, so for me, I just wanted to make sure I was on the front lines of when we tell the story of hip hop that I was one on the front, like all of us needs to be. I've talked to you, I've talked to Green Lantern. One time I had a conversation with Jazzo, crazy, right? And he asked me, you know, man, they want me to come teach at Morehouse. I was like, you should go, like, you should go. Like, dude, like I always push people to go teach the, the culture that we know by breathing. We know it, we just live right. it. And, right. and people are feeling to know what that is, especially now. If, if, if it's not a better time to talk about the power of hip hop and, the, and the, a part of hip hop that's been revolutionary, it is now. So I always thought that was important. Like my mom was a teacher and you know, I don't really care about, I'm not, big on telling being a know-it-all and telling people stuff they don't know mm -hmm. i'm more of a thing of you love it i love it so let me tell you why you do because there are certain things about it you might not understand why right. you love it right but this is the background of why you love it this is not by osmosis this is really by design and so i you know i, I try my best to do that but it's, it's super important for us to teach it because we're the practitioners of it man with Absolutely. the of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And the music that should be, or, or, the, or the time that we're in right now, let me say this, the time that we're in right now should be spawning some really amazing creative music to document the time. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, I do. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going around to all the people um, right now that last, five years ago, I sent them to Pimple Butterfly to listen to. That's the time, where, that's that's when the knife I told you so comes out. <laughs> like, <laughs> because these same people were like, these same people was like, and I remember the memes that went up about it. Like it was some right. people that loved it. It was some people that was like, you gotta be super woke to listen to it or, I'm wearing this dashiki because I'm listening to Pimp. It was jokes made about it. It right. was jokes. And the thing about To Pimp, you know what I mean? It told us everything was happening now. For sure. Everything. And I tried my best to say, hey, when it first dropped, Kendrick is saying something, man. We need to kind of hear what he's saying. Like, he, he, he's saying something. But, you know, it was all good. You know, Obama's still in office. We good, so to speak. Right. So to speak. So we like, you know, ain't got no problems. It's it's all good. But now, everybody needs a soundtrack. So now everybody needs to go back and listen to Two Pimp because Two Pimp, it was taken in front of the White House with a bunch of black kids. Like, right. if that doesn't tell you anything of what's going on now, I don't know what it is. So. What does so you know? I, I believe in balance. I believe in balance. I believe 
you know, everybody has a right to tell their story. I'm a bigger proponent of the way it sounds than what you say. Because what you say can be anything. Right. But the way it sounds, because certain sounds carry certain energies. I truly believe that. There's a reason why church makes you feel euphoric when they hit the organs, the keys on the organs. And there's a reason why some 808 sounds make you feel down and depressed. That's a whole nother class. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I believe in, you know, hip-hop lacking soul over the years has really contributed to a lot of the way our kids think. Right. The, not the, Again, not to what the rapper's saying, because I can't ever... I listen to Mob Deep, dude. Like, Mob Deep didn't... Right. <laughs> was it was hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Right. That. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I was in the mob. Like, mob was prodigy killed by 50 people on that record. <laughs> you know what right, I mean? Right, right. That's the piece. Like, that's what he did. Like, that's what he talked about. But it was the backdrop of those sounds that was like those chords, because they were using the 70s sounds from these 70s bands, using these 70s instrumentalists from out of 70s churches. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can never replace that feeling. You know what I mean? Right. So we just need that back. You can talk about, tell your story. I don't care what story you tell because I can't tell Future he can't tell his story. That's right. his story. I can't right. tell another rapper they can't tell their story. That's their story. But the backdrop of what you tell it on, that's the souls of black folk right there. And that's what we need more than anything else, so. Has the music industry made it difficult for a producer like yourself that samples because of, no? No. Because of clearances and just red tape, you know, it's easier to clear a record that doesn't have any samples or something that you can just play on the keys as opposed to chopping something up. Nah, because, you know, we got to understand that, and I said this before, Unless you are a big time seventies artist, everybody need a check, bro. Let's talk all the way about it. Like right. if if contemporary artists aren't streaming well, mm -hmm. what kind of money you think seventies artists are making? That part. Right. Not name Marvin Gaye, Barry White, James Brown. I mean, I, and I'm speaking about their estate. Nina mm -hmm. Simone. Not saying not saying none of those names. I'm talking about the persuaders, the Dells, the Drills, the Dramatics, the modulations, the the originals, like all the people that we chop up, the Silvers. You think if if I say I want to sell one, they're gonna be like, Nah, well, nah, we don't want none of that publishing. Yeah, whatever. Like you want that bag. You, yeah. you want yeah. that bag. You're not gonna. You're not gonna say, Nah, don't touch my record. You want that bad because now you're hip. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You're hip to the fact of some someone your homeboys from back in the '70s like, look, but let the young boys sample your record. You make some change from it. So right. you know what I mean? That's the talk now. So a lot of cats that I I sample, they they offering catalogs. They like, look, won't you come down, holler at me, and come get all this stuff. Come I get everything. <laughs> right, right. I got some shit that we went to put out too. Yeah, I've had. Yeah, I've had. And, and one of the people that realized that early on, well, a couple of people that realized that early on, Roy Ayers, Ahmad Jamal, Bob James, they realized it early on that how hip hop was extending their shelf life. For sure. Not everybody else is coming and say, yeah, yeah, young blood, like, come on in, you know. Yeah, come check me out. Hey, you know, what, what if what if I... What if I play, we play some beats and I play at the same time? Like, it's a thing, you know what That's I mean? Crazy. Like. Um, so it's not hard for us at all. Long as you respect it, long as you, you know, respect them. And I think a lot of cats that from the seventies, when they sit down and talk to us and we can reel off their albums back to back, they are amazed by that. They're exactly. like, wow, like you, y'all really, it's like, you have to, this is a study. This is not just something we do. This is a definite study of music and y'all are the forefathers. Of it. it is what it is. Absolutely. And moving into what's happening right now, um, your thoughts on where we are in the world. There's this 
continued fight for equality, this continued fight for respect, this continued fight to try to prove to the world that Black Lives Matter, this is something that us in hip hop have been hearing and talking about for years. But right now, it seems to be on the tip of everybody's tongue and in the front of everybody's television or phone. Um, your thoughts on everything that's happening in the world right now? You know, timing is everything. I don't, I'm, you know, I, I toggle back and forth with the idea if we, if we weren't sitting still, would people care? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. us sitting still and it's in your face makes it hard to ignore. Right. Um, 100%. So I, I, I think about that all the time and I go through that all the time. You know, um, I do believe there are some people that's not in, you know, an African diaspora that wants change. Right. I just read an article today about the gen, the Generation Z kids. Generation Z, they are, they have been, they have been exposed to so much violence through their life. You know what I mean? Uh, starting at 9-11 and right. all the way up, right? Born, right? born right into it. Yeah, just the school shooting after school shooting after school shooting. Like, when I was growing up, we, we had tornado drills and fire drills. They have school shooting drills. That's a total another monster, man. You know what I mean? So I think Generation Z is exhausted of what? the generations has done before them and they just want some change. That's why when you look around and you look out in these protests, it's a lot of young black kids, a lot of young white kids out there that's marching around, you know what I mean? Trying to make a difference. As far as everything else, you know, I was you know, I saw a clip from ESPN this morning. I forget the brother's name, but he said they were talking about the noose that was hung in um, Bubba Wallace's uh, uh, locker. locker. Or, right. And, and, you know, and, and whatever. And he was talking about how stupid that was, how cowardice that was. But he said, and I'm with him, I'm tired of giving these people energy. Like, every day we post somebody, we call them Karens. Every day we post a right. Karen saying something derogatory towards black people or whatever. And then we spend the rest of the day finding their idea, chasing them down. And up. We just need to come to the understanding that some people, we ain't going to change their mind. But we also need to come to the understanding that maybe those people are outnumbered or beginning to be outnumbered. And I'd rather not focus on that one stupid person and spend all day on Facebook and Instagram talking about it. Mm -hmm. I got better stuff to do on my time with this one stupid person to make them famous and chase them down. They already know they stupid. I, I ain't into converting the non-converted. We spend too much time trying to convert the non-converted. Like, it's going to be ignorant people out there. It's going to be stupid people all the time. I don't care what we're talking about, racism or anything else. Right. We need to focus on the people that's down with what we're trying to do. We need to focus on those people and come together and do something. I just ain't got time to be worried about some one crazy white woman or some one crazy white man who really don't want no smoke. They just want to sit there and just talk. And we spend all day posting their name everywhere. Now they a martyr. <laughs> I ain't got time for that. Like. Mm -hmm. We, li we live in a serious complaint culture and a serious talking about the problem culture instead of talking about the solution culture. Right. I'm about solutions. I ain't got time to be talking about no problems. I ain't got, I just ain't got the time. To be. The, one, the, the, the bad thing about COVID is niggas is bored, bro. Like they just sit around all day long and talk about the same thing and not trying to make no solutions and put paragraphs this long on your IG page. Man, I ain't got time for that. I just don't have time to spend doing that. Now, if you want to talk about on the phone some solutions about what's going to make a better place for my child and her children and my son and his children, I'm with that. If you ain't about that and you want to just sit on line and discuss conspiracy theories and how you deeper than everybody else, and go that way. Like, right. Let's go that way. You, you, 
we talk about all the time in the studio, like, everybody can't go. Right. Harry Tubman shot people on the way to the north, bro. She shot her own people on the way to the north. Mm -hmm. Because she knew if this fool was going to hold us up from the rest of us getting to the promised land, then that's what it's going to be. And Gotta so for me, for me, it's, I'm black power. I'm fist up, all of that. I'm also against ignorant people. And if you ignorant and you're not trying to get to a common goal at this point, then I ain't got time for it, man. I just ain't got time for it. I, yeah. I'm in Fast Empty Lounge. I ain't got right, time. Right, right, right. I'm that's trying that. to heal. I'm trying to get therapy. I'm trying to make people, have, you know, get away from this madness that we see every day, all the time, and not making no solutions. I ain't got time for that. For sure. No. You are, outside of being an intellectual and, and a, a consummate hip-hop professional and an amazing producer, um, awesome dad, just all-around great person. You're also a big sports fan, uh, like myself. There's a conversation happening right now with NBA players amongst NBA players and, and owners and just the whole entire NBA. Should the league come back? Is it going to take the focus off of what's happening in the world? Uh, or should the league, or should guys not play? I would love to hear your take. Man, it's, you know, I'm on both sides of the coin with that too. Me too. You know, when you get, when you, how old are you, Torrey? How old are you, 40? What? 40, yeah. Okay. You get in your 40s, man. Ideals are nice, but real reality is what it is. Right. Reality like, is reality. We deal with reality. We don't deal with a lot of idealistic stuff. We ain't got time for it. It's nice. It's very cool to come up with it. Well, this would be the ideal thing to do. But when you have people depending on you to live, it's, it's a totally different monster. For sure. It's kind of like the NFL. We were telling everybody that. Tell a lot of NFL players they should quit. You should quit. I don't see why you, you know. Okay, that's cool for you to say. Mm -hmm. That's that's an ideal thing to do. The reality is this one player who's 25 years old not only feeds his family, he got his mom a house, he got his cousin a house, he got their cousins a house, he taking care of the entire family. Right. Every fam everybody around him, when they when you see them in the draft, when they be in their living room and and they get they get a team and their whole family is in there, he's taking care of that his whole family. Right. Like so although it's the ideal thing to do to quit and to not I don't want to use the word quit, but to to step aside and say, you know, we have to do this. All players can't do that. Right. All players don't have the twenty, thirty million dollar a year, you know what I mean? And you made money in this game. Five hundred thousand, a million dollars ain't a lot, bro. That can go. They can be that far quick, and especially when you taking care of everybody. So I can't, I can't choose a side on it. I understand. Ideally, that's what they need to do. Ideally, they can start a league, like Kyrie said. Ideally, everybody in Kyrie Irving. Mm -hmm. Everybody's not. There's some people sitting on the other end of the bench mm -hmm. that this is getting their kid through school or this is helping their mom's medical bills or whatever. We don't know people's... We just look at it from a very vacuum or from an IG lens and that don't tell us nothing. Absolutely. So I hope they come up with a plan, but I'm not mad at what they do either way. I'm definitely not going to be selfish and say, well, I want you to play for me. I want to, I want to watch and, I think it's deeper than that, but if you choose to say you don't, you don't want to play, that's fine. If you choose to say you do want to play, that's fine. I'm not gonna judge you either way, either sure. way. Yeah, you know, like we just don't know what people's day to day reality is. And like you know. I said, everybody is not a top twenty player in the league, right? You know, it's right. twelve guys on that roster. You know that 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 eleventh man, that tenth man, that ninth man, that twelfth man. They need that bread. They need that bread. They need, they that, need bread. that. They need that bread. They got a little comp. They make two million dollars a year after taxes and knock down the one after they pay agents, knock down eight hundred thousand. Like it's a mess. So you don't know what those players doing. But the bigger players, they can say that. Now, if those bigger players say they'll take a chunk of their money to take care of the other players, and then something else, and start a league and do it that way, that's something else. But 
I think it's tough. I think it's just a tough situation, and everybody has a perspective. For sure. Now, if you understand the importance of ownership, you know, your intellectual property, you have, and congratulations on, you know, celebrating this next year as a Jamla. Um, you did something that was very unorthodox for a label, for a company starting. You put your eggs in the basket with a woman in hip hop. And I think that the conversation that was had, and I was around early, the conversation that was had was, was jump one of the dudes off and then focus on the girl. You know, why would you start with the girl? It's harder for women in hip hop. What was it about Rhapsody that made you go against the grain, go against things that were already precedented and just knew that she would be where she is in 2020? You always knew that for her. You always knew that she was Grammy Award nominated, BT Award nominated, you know, presidentially respected. Just you always had that. You always had that fire burning for what Rhapsody could be. You know, rap was... You know, contrary to popular opinion, you know, rap wasn't my first, the first artist that I had, whether male or female. She wasn't the first artist I tried to do this with. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I think the first artist I tried to do it with was uh, a guy by the name of Tom Hardy. And, right. Tom. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, sometimes things don't work out like they're supposed to. You know, looking at it from a TDE perspective, the first person that Top Dog pushed forward was J-Rock. J-Rock right. was the person that he pushed forward. K-Dot was opening for J-Rock. J-Rock was on, J-Rock was on um, the Double XL freshman class. He was the first TDE artist on there. Mm -hmm. um, nobody had, I won't say nobody, I hate to use the word nobody, but he wasn't as popular, K-Dot wasn't as popular as J-Rock was. Right. It was kind of the same thing for us. It was, we tried this artist, it didn't work. We tried this artist, it didn't work. We tried this artist, it didn't work. I, I signed rap in 2008. She didn't put out her first mixtape in 2010. So let's talk about that for a second. Most artists you sign, they're not going to sit for two years or even three. Mm -hmm. Right? Everybody remembers the round that she got game, of the, but they don't know about Jamla 2008 or 2009, which I really didn't even know if I was going to have two labels or one. Right. That's why we always say our, our inaugural year is 2010. Rap sat two years. She sat, she was working with Cooley High, but she sat two years on my label because every song she came up with me, you know, me and Jones, me and E. Jones is like, that ain't it. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. We knew she had the stage presence. She knew she had the stage presence. We knew she had the direct and the right attitude because to be on my label, you're a representation of me. So I need to be able to leave you in a room in an environment and leave and come back. And I don't hear nothing crazy. But, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and when I say a room, I'm not talking about a record label room or, or a board room. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Harvard. I'm talking about we at Harvard and I, I we up there, we chilling and skip gates and you talking to skip gates. And I said, I'll be right back. I come back. I don't want number good reports from skip gates. I want, that's a great young man, great young woman. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Cause my hat is in different. I mean, I got a, I got a music hat, a, a academia, a academic hat and a basketball hat. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm across the board. So that's what it was. It wasn't just the fact that her pen was nice. And even that took some sharpening of the iron. You are MC. You heard the different. You heard Rhapsody 2010 and Rhapsody 2015. That's two different. Rhapsody 2015 to Eve. That's two different. So you've heard that. You know what I mean? So that's what it was for me. And that she was just very passionate about what she believes. You can, if you if you go to her page and see what she reads and see what she talks about and how how vocal she is about what's going on now, like that's right in brand for what I stand for. That's right in brand for Gemma. We're not just one a one dimensional place. Um, we we deal with a lot of social issues as well, and we're very 
we live in a multiverse of things that we do in the community. So, you know, but I, you know, I had, I got the best, um, I got the best lesson of gender studies from doing, from having an artist because, because I got so many men and so many women telling me, man, I had women tell me, man, online one time because she got a vagina. I'm supposed to like her. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Like I heard that. Like, wow. Wow, wow, we, that, we doing that? Wow, that's amazing that you would say that. You know, I've, I've gotten that from women, some women, not all women, some women have told me that. Some women have told me, knife, why you gotta wear a toboggan or scully? She wants to wear that, I don't tell her what to wear. Like, what? you know what I mean? Like, why don't you make her look more sexy? And I'm like, you would think that would come from some men. Misogynistic dude, right. Women, yes. Mm -hmm. And that can be formed. That can be formulated in a way where the way those women are like that is because of patriarchy. We can get into all that, whatever. But that's what was told to me, and I'm like, wow. And then the argument came out. She has more men fans than women because the way she raps. Because I had some women tell me she raps like a man. What is that? I don't know what that is. Like, what does rapping like a man mean? Like. And I heard that from people. And so we had to fight through all that. Discrimination came from both sides. It came from, it came from men. It came from women. It came from all walks of life. And she persevered through it. So now I've always told her that no matter, you take a, you take a, a mental note of everybody who doubted you, everybody. And they always got to come back to see you. Mm -hmm. Now she, you know, she overcharging niggas what they did to the cold crush. Now. <laughs> as, you, as you should. <laughs> as you should. Ain't nothing, ain't nothing I can say. You back <laughs> the club. They, now I get hit up all the time. They can't rap me back. Well, can she come back? Well, can she write in this bag? Can she be on this bag? All I ask is I send back, I send the bag emoji. I get President Cash on it. All we want to talk about now is the bag. It's all we want to talk about. We want to talk about that. Because we try to talk about that other stuff. Well, she wanted to do this, and she wanted to do that, and she wanted to be on the cover, and she wanted, and about to try to hear. Now, it's, well, now, if you think rap bag, look at that. He in the chat. T look, I'm about to say, you see T down there with the bag. T in the chat, back, look. How bag? We won't talk about it. Like, you know what I mean? And she earned that, and that's what it is. For sure. Do you, do you all feel a, a sense of uh, vindication or validation because she is so highly regarded now and everybody's eyes is open and everybody's woken up and you know not only does she show and prove on records and, and improve with every album um but she also commands the stage you know i just saw her uh when was i, I like what was who was that bt i guess that was in january february or something and she tore that down and just you know the respect is there and there's no there's no way that you can deny it at this point you know, what does the team feel about that? We, you know, we did it our way, man. It's something about doing it your way. It's nothing with no compromise, with a whole lot of no's, with a whole lot of she ain't the one, with a whole lot of, I mean, not only her, like all the artists that I've had or, or, on, on, on Jamlin' Now, you know, I mean, Vindication starts back for me 20 years ago. Mm. 2001, 2002. Why are you sampling? Why are you making beats on computer? Don't nobody want to hear that? Like, you know, this is, I'm a Southern producer. Whatever the hell that is. Um, mm. I thought it was a producer. I didn't know it was Southern and Northern. I didn't know that was a thing. Mm. I just made beats. And they said, oh, you just a Southern producer. You a backpacker. Don't nobody want to hear that? Whatever, whatever, whatever until Jay-Z hit and you know we we used to say all the time man we every time something happens with us we used to say we gonna start selling Jamla throw up buckets like a bucket with <laughs> with jam on the front and the LeBron the LeBron packet stuff you you throw on you sprinkle on throw up right put jam on the front of it because there's a lot of people man who every time we doing something they just go off somewhere and get sick because these are the same people that 
doubted us, man. Doubted me. Thought that, you know, I had to go a certain way or I had to do a certain thing or me making beats on the computer wouldn't work or nobody wanted to hear that or boom bap is dead or sampling is dead or all the stuff they ever told me. And I just took that energy on to Jamla. And then it was the same thing. Don't nobody want to hear that. Maybe y'all need to change the sound. Don't nobody. And then next thing you know, we at the Rock Nation brush looking crazy, taking pictures. <laughs> you, see? you know what I'm saying? Hardest <laughs> ticket in town. The little backpack kids, the little the little underground kids at the Rock Nation brush. Well, mm -hmm. y'all. And see, and if I say that, I'm a jerk. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? You've known me forever. That's Sometimes not my motive. I do my work. I do you my work. And, and you know what? Every time I decide to talk it, everybody around me is like, yes, talk it. And I'm like, that ain't me, man. Like, mm -hmm. it just ain't never been me. But I got to say stuff like that because I know on that level, they can get it. Mm -hmm. I don't really get into the craziness, but I know me taking a picture of the Rock Nation brunch, that's something to you. You know what I mean? Like, right. and that's what it is. Like, it's, it's crazy, but we we fought tooth and nail to get where we are. Um, we deserve to be here. For sure. But we, we spent 10 years doing it. And it's so crazy to say, man, we just getting started, man. That's the, <laughs> we're just that's the getting started. That's the part. That's the part I'm excited about because it's now, you know, it took 10 years for people to see exactly what it was and what you had going on. And now that you got their eyes and their ears. It's time to go crazy. Before I let you go, Knife, I want to get into who Jamal is right now. But every win, every win for you all, you know, I, we text often. I'll hit Rat. I'll hit Jones. I'll hit Cash. You know, I just, those wins mean a lot. I'm, I'm a direct fruit from your fit, from your tree. You know what I'm saying? Just like when, when Justice League started, the LB started, you guys were fruits from that native tree. My success, what I'm able to do, is a result of working with you, working with Crisis, working with Jones, you know, coming down in North Carolina, sleeping in the studio, working on joints, you know, staying extra days, drop, whatever it is, you know, so your wins and, and my wins is all like mutual family success. And I always want to make sure that I use my platform to elevate that. And also anytime there's ever a conversation, I want to be one of the ones to send your praises out loud in front of everybody. Thank you, man. Thank yeah, not only were you helpful, man, but all of these wins are big wins for all of us that come from where we come from. So who is Jamla in 2020? God, man, you know, we, we've branched out so many ways. Like, you know, we have producers here. We have artists here, of course. Um, each artist is different. Each artist have has a different story. Um, the leader has... Me and being the leader have several different stories. Um, we're now getting into sports, which is, you know, but our, our, our method of getting into sports is different from everybody else's. We are totally concerned about the mind of the young athlete, the young grassroots athlete. And that means when I say grassroots, I mean from age 14 until the time they're going in, in the NBA. Um, we're in basketball now. Cash has a love for football, so we'll be getting into that. Just making sure that these young kids have got their mind on straight. Um, we've always been involved in academia, which is huge. Um, if I'm doing something, even the class, the beat class I teach at Duke, Crisis has taught it with me two years in a row now, um, which is dope that I, you know, that he does an in class thing with me. Um, I'm trying my best to show my artist diversity, how you can, can take your one passion and spread it amongst a amongst, amongst bunch of mediums. I think we think hip hop very linear, that we can only rap, produce, whatever, even or be a manager or be whatever. It's even past that. Hip hop is a global art form. So now, and the influence is everywhere. So now we can take that influence into the biggest corporate boardroom that we can. And I'm trying to get my team to understand that, just to understand the power that they have. And um, that's what we are. Music is the easy part. Beats not the easy part. We can do that in our sleep. 
I think now it's where else can we take it? And okay. these have been these have been the places that we've taken it. You know, at first Jamla had you as a friend, Clark Kent. I see Clark Kent over here. Uh, Pete Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta ring it off. For, I gotta ring it off for Big Bro. One right, time. you know everybody's. You know, from Raekwon to Chance the Rapper to the late great Nipsey Hussle to the late great Mac Miller, they've all been through these doors. But as the years went on, then Grant Hill started to walk through the door, and Dave Chappelle's been through here, and just different people from all walks of life has been through these doors. And, and now I'm understanding that, and now we have actors that then came through here, actresses like. Different people have come through, and I'm starting to understand that we're just not music anymore. We're more than that. We're, we're this is a culture brand. This is not a this is a music brand only. So absolutely, I remember we watched the uh, we watched the finals. I think we watched the finals one year with Grant Hill at, at the studio. Yeah, the studio. Yeah, you remember? <laughs> I looked over. I said, I'm watching the finals with Knife Wonder and Grant. Oh, <laughs> just <laughs> amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. We're uh, almost out of time. Like, I want to ask about your involvement with the National Museum of African American Studies. What is that exactly? Um, the National Museum of African American History, Culture, the Smithsonian Institute, Washington D.C. I, <laughs> I am on. Talk the, your uh, shit. <laughs> I am on the. Uh, I'm a part of two factions in D.C. I'm on the. Um, I'm on the rap committee for that. Shouts to Timothy Ann Burnside who. You know, he was a um, major player in that particular museum and also a member of Black Jedi Zulu. Um, Love her. Good people, man. Good people. Um, so I'm on that committee. I'm also on the Hip Hop Council for the Kennedy Center of Performing Arts, along with Q-Tip and so many others. So again, we're trying to make sure our place is cemented in culture and history. It's very important for us. Which is funny, I was talking about the museum last night if you think by any measure that when you know hopefully the pandemic blows over and we're able to come back outside that museum is going to be filled with so many white people it's mm. because now it's the mm. scramble they mm -hmm. are in their mind they're thinking what's the number one place that I can get all the information I need to get and understand the whatever it's that Smithsonian. I That's think, right. it, you know, I, I've been in there with, you know, some some, some white people, and they let, they leave like, wow, I had no idea. There's some black people that leave and say, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I've been involved in that for the last, since it opened. Um, I have an exhibit on the fourth floor, Musical Crossroads. If you go on Musical Crossroads, go to the fourth floor. I have an exhibit. Um, it's a, a big screen, me talking, there's a beat machine under it. You can kind of virtual beat machine make. Wow. Um, and the, on this side is Dilla's beat machine, and on that side is a Prince exhibit. So I'm, you know, that's... It's not, not too bad company, huh? That's not too bad. It's not too bad. Um, but, um, yeah, man, just to being involved in that, man, just like I said, and, and I don't I don't plan on stopping there. I want to I wanna take a little bit further than that. Uh, I really want to be one of the world leaders in preserving of this culture the best way I can. So You are. You already are. So many people look to you for inspiration, for tutelage, for music, for love, for culture. Um, you know, when, when I go live with anybody I go live with, they're very deserving of their flowers. I want to take this moment. Thank you. It's yours. Thank you. Um, with so much more to do and so much more to go, Lord willing, but you were already cemented in hip hop in the fabric. You are a legend, you are an icon, and you one of our greats, Knife, and we love you, brother. I love you too, man. There is no, ain't no finish line, Torre. It ain't no finish line. Keep going. Got a finish line. Yeah. Keep going. Love, okay. Congratulations again on 10 years of Jam We're going to celebrate Thank it you. with the music. You know, I'm always here, whatever you need, whenever you need it. We a text away, a phone call away, family. Man, my man. When it's over, come see us, dog. Come see us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might, I might start rapping again next this year. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Christ, you hear that? <laughs> All right, no doubt. Shout out to my brother, Crisis. <laughs> hey, I love you, man. I'll speak to you soon. All right, peace, man. Peace, peace, peace. peace.